Alaska, the frozen frontier, where ice and snow cloak huge deposits of oil. 1973, oil shortage, gas crisis, and a nation desperate for Alaskan crude. The risky solution? A pipeline across 800 miles of pristine wilderness, active fault lines, and a hostile terrain. Now, the challenge of the Alaskan oil pipeline on Modern Marvel. is what 75 degrees below zero looks like above the Arctic Circle. When temperatures drop this low, living, merely being becomes a struggle. Exposed flesh freezes and dies in 10 minutes. Fingers freeze solid in only 90. I took my mitten off and instantly wished I hadn't. The cold was horrible and sank through my skin, freezing in place all the nerves and tendons beneath it. The limb was soon useless to me. The viscous fluid of my eyes felt as though they were freezing over and turning to glass. Diary entry, an Arctic explorer. In 1958, two oil companies seemingly defied common sense by exploring for oil in this harsh and unforgiving place. Ten years later, the two oil companies, Humble Oil, now Exxon, and Atlantic Richfield, announced they have discovered the largest oil field in North America. The oil is in Alaska, just beneath its Prudhoe Bay, and there are close to 10 billion barrels waiting for them. A staggering total of over 420 billion gallons of fuel. The area around Prudhoe Bay is known as Alaska's North Slope, located deep within the Arctic Circle. It is a timeless wilderness that has gone virtually untouched by man. The nearest human contact is some 500 miles away. At the same time as public awareness of environmental issues grows, so does pressure on lawmakers to begin creating legislation that will protect the environment from its most willful offenders. Often, that was big industry. Events came to a head when a nationwide rally is called. It became known as Earth Day. 20 million people demonstrated. This was the first time the public had an opportunity to express their concern about the deterioration of the environment which uh, the political establishment hadn't been paying any attention to. And for the first time the environmental movement as a whole began to take on muscle. So they were well prepared at the time of the discovery of oil in Prudhoe Bay in 1968 to take it head on. The people had spoken and the government began to listen. In Washington, plans were to establish a watchdog organization. An environmental protection agency began to take shape, along with a host of landmark legislation setting federal standards for clean air and clean water. The oil companies announced that they intended to build an 800-mile-long pipeline that would cut a path through the very heart of the state, southward to Valdez. To environmentalists, crude could be applied to the whole unseemly plan, not just to what would be flowing through its steel pipe. By the end of 1968, groups such as the Friends of the Earth and the Wilderness Society vowed to bring a halt to the proposed project. We took the last great place and we put this thing across it. And that is an indication of our casual contempt for something as important, as fragile, as ecologically irreplaceable as the great heart of Alaska. But the oil companies involved in exploring the North Slope moved quickly to form a partnership to share in the huge expense of this mammoth undertaking. The partners were now known collectively as Alyeska, the given name for Alaska by its Aleut Indians. It translates as Great Land. An order went out for 800 miles of pipeline 48 inches in diameter, the only size thought capable of withstanding the immense pressure of the two million barrels of oil that would be pumped through it each day. The 550,000 tons of pipeline would have to be shipped on huge barges from steel plants in Japan at what was considered an exorbitant price, $100 million. When the cost of the construction eventually soared to over nine billion, this was considered the pipeline's one and only true bargain. 
But with the arrival of pipe supplies and crews also comes lawsuits and injunctions against construction from concerned environmentalist groups. It is a test of the newly signed National Environmental Protection Act, NEPA, which will set legal standards on all projects having an effect on the environment. The freewheeling days of the old oil monopolies were long gone. Oil companies no longer simply got whatever they wished. The public now had a greater say in the matter. The oil companies did not, in my view, anticipate the vigor of the opposition they would have in uh, building this uh, pipeline. But I think they were initially surprised by that. To Alaskan natives and environmentalists, the oil companies seemed less interested in protecting nature than they do their profits. Careful examination will need to be made if the plan is to proceed. And I think because of the actions of the environmentalists in uh, asserting they would sue unless certain construction design remedies were incorporated into the into the uh, project that uh, we would have had a much less successful pipeline venture than we now have. By April 1970, less than 10 months after Arco's announcement to build a pipeline, construction stops before it ever truly begins. Congress and the courts put a halt to the project. The pipeline isn't so much in Alaska as it is in limbo. Alaska is a larger-than-life place that has always attracted dreamers and hard-souled men of action, all scheming to make fortunes off its generous lands. The Russians had practiced this philosophy long before America did. During the late 1700s, Alaska was a part of Russia and served as her base for the booming fur trade, the richest enterprise in the world. A single sea otter skin could equal three times the average Russian's yearly income. By 1866, Russia was in near financial ruin due to her military humiliation at the hands of Francis Napoleon III in the Crimean War. Russia needed money, badly. Knowing this, American Secretary of State William Seward began urging President Andrew Johnson to purchase Alaska as a source of great natural wealth for the growing young republic. The price was a steal, seven million dollars. Broken down, it worked out to two cents an acre. The smart thinkers of the day thought it was too much. Seward was labeled an idiot in the newspapers. They called the treaty Seward's folly. Seward prevailed and finally convinced Congress to purchase Alaska. By the turn of the century, money was flowing back to the rest of America in the form of whaling, timber, and the Alaska gold rush. By 1898, more than $300 million in Klondike gold had been extracted from Alaska's fertile ground. By the year of its admission to statehood in 1959, Seward's folly had already made a $50 billion return on the government's initial investment. In another 10 years, that figure would double itself, not in gold, but in black gold. The state of Alaska receives more in oil taxes and royalties every two days than the 7.2 million paid to Russia to purchase the territory. We now return to modern marvels. The history of oil is a happy accident, beginning with the industry's first wildcatter, Edwin Drake. Edwin Drake was uh, what we would call an entrepreneur. In the 19th century, he, he would be called a fortune hunter. He went out looking for ways to make money, and essentially he drilled the first modern oil well. Instead of simply mopping up the oil seeps on the surface as others were doing, Drake was the first to see what might lie below the ground with his drill. He used a water drilling technique which was basically hammering a pipe into the ground. Until Drake, people had been using whale oil to light their lanterns. But whales were being hunted down at a tremendous rate. It was a lighting source that was literally doomed for extinction. A larger, more readily available source for lighting was needed. Drake's investors looked to Titusville, Pennsylvania to make their fortune. Here, oil freely floated up from the earth in a place called Oil Creek. The local Indians, the Seneca, knew about oil and used it for medicinal purposes. Later, the white man would bottle the stuff up and call it snake oil. 
a play on the word Seneca. Drake dug deeper, but time and money were running out. The well looked to be a dry one. Drake's investors wanted to pull out and cut their losses. A letter was sent to Drake advising him to pay his remaining bills and close the operation by the end of the day. Fortunately for Drake, the mail was late. Drake didn't get the letter until the next day, just as oil began flowing from his well. The history of the modern oil industry had been a mere 12 hours away from being dramatically altered. As for Drake, the Wildcatter title was well earned. He took all the money that he earned from that very first well and spent every last dime looking for another one. Drake died 21 years later at the age of 61, absolutely penniless. Now that Drake had shown that oil could be tapped, the trick became finding a way to get it from the field into people's homes. Americans were developing a quick addiction to oil. The uh, quantity of oil that was being demanded by consumers was rising very rapidly and uh, oil had, for the most part, been shipped in literally in barrels. And then those tanks uh, were being hauled around by wagons and, and then that was too slow and not enough and they started loading this on the railroads. It was because of the railroads that America's first oil pipeline was built. John D. Rockefeller was an oil tycoon, but he also controlled most of the railroads that traveled between Pennsylvania and the oil-thirsty cities along the eastern seaboard. Because of this power, Rockefeller was able to dictate what freight fees were charged to his smaller oil-producing competitors, fees that took a big bite out of their profits. Rockefeller's competition organized themselves into a group called the Independents, the independents seized upon a radical new idea, build a 100 mile long pipeline and let their fortunes flow virtually to their customers' doorsteps. People really didn't know how to build pipelines either. In the, in the early days of the oil industry, uh, some of the first pipelines were built out of trees that were bored out so that you had wooden pipelines. Um, then uh, manufactured steel, uh, cast iron pipelines were being used. But Rockefeller wouldn't go down without a fight. He delayed their construction any way he could, including blocking the path of their pipeline with his trains. When that failed to make the competition fold, Rockefeller decided to beat them at their own game. Rockefeller, in fact, began by building a competing pipeline because he realized that you could not possibly control the production of the oil. But if you control what's called the downstream aspects, the shipping and the refining, then you would control the market. So he actually put the Independence Pipeline out of business by building a bigger and more efficient pipeline. The entire fledgling oil industry quickly realized that pipelines were the most efficient way of delivering oil to the public. By 1880, more than 75% of America's oil was being transported by pipelines. Sixty years later, another important pipeline would be built to deliver oil to the East Coast. It was called the Big Inch, and its purpose was to deliver fuel to America's warships as they set sail for battle in Europe. By 1880, oil had gone from being used as a medicine to lighting an entire nation, but it was soon to be put to an even more extraordinary use. Edwin Drake had been looking for oil to light lamps by kerosene. As kerosene is refined, a byproduct is produced, gasoline. Until the combustion engine was invented in 1892, gasoline was considered a waste product of no use to anyone. The oil and automobile industries rapidly changed America's energy needs. In the first 40 years of the existence of the automobile, there were an astounding 24 million cars in use in the United States. In the post-World War II years, that number increased to 90 million. More than 28 billion gallons of oil were being consumed by Americans every year. The American love affair with the automobile had firmly taken root. The soldiers came back, they had cheap loans, they started buying things, the economy boomed. People switched from tanks to cars, they switched from bombers to prefab houses. Uh, Levittown, the great, uh, the great suburb, 
was developed. The result was that you had a marriage really between the economy, the automobile industry, which was the biggest industry, and then the oil industry, which was really pretty much the second biggest industry. When President Eisenhower initiated the Federal Highway Act, it gave America a modern set of roads that would link it from coast to coast. Detroit automakers encouraged folks to get out and discover the country, and Americans did, including Alaska. Improvements were underway on the Alcan Highway, the lower 48's direct link to its new estate via Canada. For some, the Alaskan-Canadian Highway went a long way to paving the way for the Alaskan oil pipeline. Certainly construction of the highway, the Alcan Highway, conditioned folk to accept a major project that would cut across wilderness country. And some of us, including myself, again, felt that since we already had an incursion into a wilderness area through the highway, why not put the pipeline parallel down it? The fortunes of a nation and the oil industry were tied. They grew together at a one-to-one -one ratio during those heavy boom years. Oil's influence was felt everywhere. Cars, appliances, homes, everything ran on the power that oil provided. And by the late 1960s, America's appetite for oil far outstripped its domestic supply. Most of the oil consumed by Americans did not come from within their own borders. Dependence on foreign produced oil from the Middle East had been growing steadily for over a decade. America needed a solution to its growing problem, and the Alaskan oil pipeline seemed to offer a solution. But with environmental issues still clouding the picture, its future looked bleak. During the 1990s, one-tenth of all oil used by Americans passed through the Alaskan oil pipeline. We now return to modern marvels. It wasn't politicians in Washington or engineers in Anchorage that changed the fate of the Alaskan pipeline. It was the actions taken by a small group of Middle Eastern oil sheiks from OPEC, the Organization of Oil Exporting Countries. So you had the situation where the oil companies were ready to construct the pipeline and they faced such strong environmental opposition, they simply could not proceed. And then they received the very nice gift of an oil crisis. Two and three hour lines at gas stations became the norm. Gas crunch, odd even days and rationing became buzzwords. In 1973, OPEC was a dirty one. The oil embargo cemented in everyone's minds the need to end America's dependence on foreign oil. The issue was larger than just a lack of cheap gasoline. This did a lot of economic damage. It's the same as if you have a tax. Uh, you take money out of the pockets of consumers. They can't spend as much. They don't buy things. Factories cut back. Factories lay off workers. You get a recession. And the, the oil crisis was really the end of the post-war economic boom. America's energy demands have grown so rapidly that they now outstrip our energy supplies. As a result, we face the possibility of temporary fuel shortages and some increases in fuel prices in America. This is a serious challenge. If the spigot could be turned on, over 25% of the nation's oil supply would come flowing daily from Alaska. A country gripped by inflation and high unemployment would also gain over 70,000 jobs, an important boom in bad times. Opposition to the pipeline was quickly fading. For more than four decades, oil companies had been searching for oil in Alaska. Its existence had been known for years. The Eskimos, like the Seneca, had been using oil as a cock for their canoes. But with discovery of oil comes equal parts joy and dread. Oil is many times a mixed blessing. They've known about oil in Alaska since the 1920s. There were wells punched, I think, in 1922. And you can see evidence of that still. Some of the old uh, trails and, and drilling devices are still in place. Exploring for oil had never been a cheap endeavor. Years of wildcatting often resulted in nothing more than empty hunches and a flatter wallet. Today's average well costs five million dollars before any return might be seen. Oil production in remote areas like the Arctic Circle and the North Sea were even more expensive to explore. 
By the 60s and 70s, that was no longer the case. With demand high and the financial returns great enough, oil companies were stretching their search ever outward. For one pioneering explorer, British Petroleum, the wildcatting spirit of Edwin Drake, lived on. BP had been the sole company looking for oil along Alaska's Arctic coastline, and since 1958, British Petroleum had acquired leases on hundreds of thousands of state-owned acres around the North Slope. For 10 long years, every well that had been dug had come up dry, and by 1968, they had pulled up stakes and abandoned any hope of hitting oil. Nearby, Arco's luck was better. Using a derrick that British Petroleum had left behind, Arco hit oil. BP's Alaska hunch was right. They had just been drilling in the wrong places. British Petroleum came back to the slope in a hurry. They still owned a number of leases, and when the, when the discovery was made, uh, Arco and them volunteered to acquire those leases, and BP says, no, I think we'll put one more hole down. And of course, they hit as well in the Prudhoe Bay area. An oil fever was raging now. The remaining state lands in Prudhoe Bay were to be sold at auction. Total amount of bid, 3,546,294. The same land that had gone for only $12 an acre a year earlier was now fetching well over 2000 When the auctioning was complete, Alaska's treasury had grown wealthier by more than $900 million. With the environmentalist voices weakened in light of looming oil shortages, a go-ahead seemed to be drawing nearer for the pipeline. Engineers and designers started focusing on the nuts and bolts of production. And while a pipeline may have been the favorite plan of the oil companies, they agreed to look at alternate routes due to the pressure of concerned environmentalists. The Teamsters wanted to have a big four-lane highway up there that they could haul it by truck. We we're talking about hauling it subsurface under the ice by submarine. All sorts of schemes and plans that uh, uh, were laid one by one to rest mercifully. <laughs> One of those was the SS Manhattan, a double-hulled tanker with ice-breaking capabilities. It would be a test to see if oil could be moved through the straits of the icy Bering Sea. On its journey northward in the summer of 1969, the Manhattan time and again found itself stuck in ice. The big tanker repeatedly needed to be rescued by the other icebreakers. At one point during the test run, a projection of ice managed to rip a giant gash along its thick steel hull. The Manhattan was empty, but for a ship capable of carrying 700,000 barrels of oil, it was an ominous note of the potential dangers of shipping oil across the sea. While ice-breaking tankers like the SS Manhattan were no longer an option, tankers as a whole would still have a vital role to play in the pipeline system. By transporting the oil through a pipeline, right through the middle of Alaska to the ice-free port of Valdez, we would be able to move tankers through that area 24 hours a day, seven days a week, without fear of that area freezing up. So that provided the most economical and most environmentally sound route to follow. Even with the route chosen, the pipeline faces an even trickier path ahead. Thousands of lawsuits and environmentalists' court challenges threaten to undermine the project at any step of the way. Unless they are settled, pipeline construction simply cannot move forward. Among them are lawsuits brought by Alaska's 200 Indian tribes. The native claims seek legal assurance that reimbursements will be made for the pipeline's right-of-way through Indian territory. The fate of the pipeline comes down to one final vote in the Senate. It is the project's last chance for survival. One radical sweeping bill can clear-cut the way for the pipeline. The vote was the tide at 48-48. And uh, Vice President uh, Spiro Agnew cast the vote in favor of the Gravel Amendment to cut off further lawsuits. And that was the bill, the legislation, that uh, in effect settled the issue and allowed the pipeline to go forward. Interestingly, Agnew's last act as vice president was giving the pipeline its go-ahead. The 100,000 pieces of pipe that have been gathering dust on Alaskan docks for the past six years are finally going to be put to use. 
the work stoppage is over, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline is about to be officially underway. And now that the legal obstacles have been overcome, it is time to overcome building on a land known for its devastating earthquakes. When pipeline construction began, so many people came to Alaska in search of work that the state government put ads in newspapers asking people to stay home. We now return to modern marvels. The Alaskan pipeline was an original. There had been nothing like it before. More than three million tons of machinery and supplies had to be delivered north. Most of it was shipped during the summer months on giant sea barges to take advantage of the reduced risk of dangerous ice flows. And that included crew quarters, all prefabricated in the lower 48. After being tugged into Prudhoe Bay, they would be towed off, moved into place, and welded together. Building in the harsh Arctic environment would test engineers' technical know-how at every turn, beginning with nature that wasn't going to turn over its bounty without a fight. Its secret weapon was a little studied phenomenon called permafrost, soft, silty soil that is infused with ice. It is any ground that has remained frozen for more than two years. If it is given the chance to thaw, the soil around it turns to mud. Pipeline with individual segments weighing 9,000 pounds apiece simply can't survive without stable ground beneath it. Oil comes out of the ground at temperatures approaching 130 degrees. So if a hot oil pipeline were allowed to come in contact with the permafrost, the permafrost would melt. The pipeline would need to be elevated over the frozen ground for more than 400 of its 800 miles. It was also a very unique system of, of being able to take the heat from the pipeline and put it into a jacket that surrounds the pipeline that heat would dissipate by vaporizing as it boiled and vented out the top so that you actually pulled the heat from the pipeline and didn't impact the permafrost. And it wasn't only the permafrost that needed protecting. Environmental groups had feared that animals would see the pipeline as a sort of fence and that migrating habits would be broken. Designers promised to devise a solution. We also had, though, wildlife to, to think about, particularly the migrating caribou herds. So in a number of locations, we actually elevated the pipeline so that the caribou could cross under it. In other locations, we put the pipeline underground, thus creating a, an area where the caribou could migrate through. Unique features that aren't found in most, most pipelines around the world. There was one other obstacle that would need to be considered, earthquakes. At 5.35 on Good Friday morning, 1964, Alaska suffered through one of the most powerful earthquakes ever recorded. It registered an explosive 8.4 on the Richter scale and lasted a gut-wrenching four minutes. Its energy 800,000 times as great as the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Downtown Anchorage was completely destroyed. If permafrost provided engineers with an unsteady base, how do you build atop one of the world's largest fault lines? Pipeline, as it crosses over the Denali Fault, is designed to actually move 20 feet horizontally and as much as five feet vertically in the event of a seismic event. It's designed to withstand an 8.5 on the Richter scale. That bit of engineering has never been put to the test yet. Engineers are always being asked if the shortest route between point A and B is a straight line, why does the Alaskan pipeline zigzag? The answer is twofold. The zigzag, which is often exaggerated by telephoto lenses, stabilizes the pipeline in the event of an earthquake. It also allows room for the pipe to expand and contract during temperature fluctuations. Living in the out-of-the-way Arctic meant everything down to the last nut and bolt had to be thought of and provided for. It wasn't a glamorous life. Small quarters shared with a bunkmate, cafeteria food, and a couple of TV channels for a link with the rest of the world. The money was the draw for most, close to $1,100 a week, double the going rate in the States. When, when I first came to Alaska, I went through Arctic uh, orientation. You'd take uh, the little book called Staying Alive in the Arctic. We all carried that little book and always carry some matches, you know, so if, if at least if you were freezing to death, you could burn the book Staying Alive in the Arctic, <laughs> you know. 
In the course of two years of construction, more than 70,000 people worked on the line, 7,000 of them women. For a project this challenging and trying, it was a safe one. Amazingly, only 31 people died while building the pipeline. Alaskan residents pay no state income tax. Instead, each person over six months of age receives an oil dividend check. They averaged $1,000 per year during the 1990s. We now return to modern marvels. Together, Thompson Pass and Adigan Pass would come to be known as the last and most dangerous miles along the pipeline's torturous route. Adigan and Thompson sometimes are talked about together, but they really are very different places, and the challenges are really a lot different. Uh, they shared one thing in common, though. They both had to be done by the winter of 1976 in order for us to start up in 1977. The pipeline was scheduled to open in less than six months, but a failure to finish the work in Adigan and Thompson Passes would mean a delay of almost a full year. Construction during the winter months would be impossible in both places, so if the team missed their deadline, it would be a long wait until next summer. It's rainy, it's snowy, it's sleets, it's foggy, it's terrible. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's just atrocious conditions. Uh, the, the rock there is, is, is slippery rock. You know, and so when, when it's wet or has snow on it, it you just can't keep your footing. Uh, you slip and slide around. It, it's just a nasty place to work. Adigan Pass is located near the start of the line, deep within the Arctic Circle. It is a treacherous land. Avalanches occur here during the winter on a regular basis. At 4,000 feet, it would be the highest point that the pipeline must climb to. Because of the threat of snow slides, the pipeline would be encased in a mammoth concrete box. A trench was dug right into the mountain itself, with the granite acting as a giant concrete pore form. Over 100,000 cubic yards of dirt were used to backfill the giant trench more than enough to fill an entire football stadium. The plan worked. Thompson Pass presented a different but just as harrowing challenge. The big challenge at Thompson Pass was the vertical drop and the steepness of the drop. Uh, the drop is so steep that conventional caterpillar tractors, cats, couldn't operate on it because their oil lubrication systems weren't even designed to, for them to operate on that steep of a slope. Normal machinery couldn't go up and down. To get around the severe 60 degree angle, the engineers devised a unique system, a makeshift aerial tramway. Men and materials were actually flown through the air from the bottom to the top of the two mile long sheer wall. The fog is such that you really don't have good visibility. I mean, when the, when the pipe was coming down the aerial tramway, it would kind of just appear, you know, like coming out of a ghosty mist. A little storm would blow in, and I've seen times when the, when the welders who were actually working on the pipe were actually hanging off their safety harnesses. They just physically couldn't get uh, any footing. As one worker put it, it was as if nature was putting up a fight, making you earn whatever you managed to wrestle out of it. As a manager, you had to do whatever had to be done to make sure that that, uh, that Adigan Pass was complete in 1976. The rest was uh, a problem, but uh, with those two complete, it was a cakewalk. <laughs> with both Adigan and Thompson Passes successfully completed, it was time to hit the start button on the Alaskan pipeline. It was called Oil In Day. And now, after two years of construction, 800 miles, $9 billion and 70,000 workers, the largest and most expensive construction project was finally completed. On June 20th, 1977, oil finally began to flow through the Alaskan oil pipeline. Each time it went through a pump station, everybody drew off some samples. It was kind of like tapping a keg. You know, we all said, hey, uh, we got to get a sample of this thing. What do we got? So you went into the mess hall and you got an old ketchup bottle that had just been, <laughs> you know, emptied or so, a, you know, a mayonnaise jar or something like that because none of us had anything to put it, put it in.
Alaskan crude begins its 800 mile journey here at pump station number one, located on the edge of the Prudhoe Bay oil field. And this is where the pipeline emerges for the first time from the ground to start its trek to Valdez. There isn't just one well site, there are literally a thousand. Several smaller feeder lines bring their supply of crude to the pump station, where they join together to become the Alaskan oil pipeline. Thanks to more advanced drilling techniques, a wellhead today is no bigger than a typical tool shed. Gone are the days of boomtown clutter, and because of horizontal drilling techniques, a well's footprint is significantly smaller. Several wells can be drilled from a single spot, covering thousands of acres below. A metering system has been installed here to correctly calculate how much oil is being brought into the pipeline. If you're a producing oil company, it's critical to know exactly how much you're putting in one end, because you get paid for what comes out the other. At its peak of production, the pipeline was designed to send over two million barrels, or 84 million gallons of oil down the pipeline every single day. Two giant Rolls-Royce turbo engines, the same as used on jumbo jets, are capable of pushing over 40,000 gallons of crude oil per minute. The crude travels between two to four miles per hour, and takes almost five days to reach Valdez at the end of the line. The pump stations are also where pigs are placed into the pipe and sent floating downstream. Not the barnyard variety, but the super sophisticated type. No one remembers exactly how they got their name, though it might be because the old ones used to be made of leather and were said to squeal as they flowed down the pipe. Now pigs do more than just scrub and clean the inside walls of the pipeline. Today's pigs are used to help crews in preventative maintenance, looking for small abnormalities in the pipe system before they can turn into bigger problems. The final stop for the oil is at the marine terminal in Valdez, the northernmost ice-free seaport located at the top of the Prince William Sound. Drawing from one of its 18 giant holding tanks, each containing more than half a million barrels of crude, 180,000 barrels of oil flow through this terminus every single hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and with four docks located in Valdez, up to four supersized super tankers could be entirely pumped full of fuel each day. The last critical component of the system are the super tankers themselves. These floating giants are responsible for delivering Alaskan oil to the rest of the lower 48. Today's oil tankers are the largest man-made objects to freely travel the surface of the earth. Now the biggest one that calls on Valdez is 265,000 dead weight tons. Just to put that into perspective, that's over 1.8 million barrels of oil that that tanker carries as it transits through Prince William Sound to market. Tankers are not a new phenomenon. They've been used since the late 1800s and as the oil industry grew, so did they. Some of today's super tankers are over 1,500 feet long and 200 feet wide the equivalent of over five football fields in length. It is a very efficient way of moving oil long distances. It's much more uh, economic than pipelines. The biggest problems that we've had uh, in the United States actually with oil spills have, uh, have been more from tankers having problems than we've had from pipelines. March 1989. The world watched in horror as close to 11 million gallons of crude oil hemorrhaged from a super tanker onto the pristine shores of Prince William Sound. Exxon Valdez oil spill was the, the worst nightmare that environmentalists or anybody else could have because this is a tremendously important and productive uh, biological region. Uh, the damage was uh, tremendous and everything we got out of that pipeline, in my view, uh, is not worth the damage that that oil spill did. We've been on the verge of bankruptcy many times prior to the pipeline. Ironically, we've been bailed out by natural disasters. First was the earthquake in 1964 that poured billions and bi or millions and billions of dollars of federal aid. We had another natural disaster, the Exxon Valdez oil spill, that pumped millions and millions of new dollars into the state. Terrible uh, situation to have to rely on natural disasters for sustaining your economy. 
In the eight years since the Exxon Valdez spill, much has changed about the way tanker operations occur here. There is a fleet of over 40 sea spill ships standing by at the ready, 24 hours a day. There are another 300 ships kept under contract in the immediate area that are also a part of the emergency response team. Ships of every size and function, from recovery vessels capable of sucking up more than 2,000 barrels of oil in an hour, to skimmers, tugs, and emergency response boats, ready to deploy hundreds of thousands of feet of containment booms in minutes. Unlike procedures in 1989, two tugboats are now assigned to every incoming and outgoing tanker during their 70-mile transit. Traffic lanes have also been designated and are carefully watched by guidance and control room operators. The people who operate the Trans-Alaska Pipeline took the Exxon Valdez spill very seriously, and that spill just kind of shook our organization and our pride to its very core. And we feel we're in a position to respond if something like that would happen again, but more importantly, that we can prevent something like that from ever happening again. At current projections, today's pipeline is due to be shut down sometime in the next 20 years, once its 10 billion barrels of oil have been completely drained. That's close to a 40-year run as America's premier supplier of oil. In September 1996, another oil field was discovered alongside Prudhoe Bay. This one possibly equaling the oil deposit that the Alaskan pipeline draws its oil from. If the government approves of further drilling on the North Slope, oil could continue flowing from pipeline add-ons well into the new millennium. Conservative estimates set the value of the new find at more than $350 billion. But as in the past, environmentalists question the need to go into one of the world's last, most pristine environments. Known as ANWR, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, it is 19 million federally protected acres of land. Is there no point at which we will not stop and say, wait a minute, this place cannot be damaged. This place is too important. If we don't hold ourselves back here, where will we? We might as well start drilling in Yosemite, because no place is sacred, and it's pointless. It's stupid, and we shouldn't do it. After 20 years of operation, what is the scorecard on the Alaskan pipeline today? Technologically, the pipeline has exceeded anyone's expectations, pushing Arctic engineering to an entirely new level. Spills have occurred on the pipeline itself, but they have been minor, measured in gallons, not in barrels. Environmentally, its short-term impact seems to be minimal. The pipeline seems to have lived up to its designer's promises. In the long term, only time will tell if human activity on such a massive scale brings damage to such a sensitive land. Sociologically, the pipeline has been a provider of opportunities, jobs, new schools, and hospitals for Alaskan residents, and a regained independence for America from foreign influences. When and if the day ever comes that there is no further need for an Alaskan pipeline, its charter provides for its complete removal and restoration of the land to its original condition. Some 20 years after its completion, the Alaskan oil pipeline still generates strong feelings. You sort of have to close your eyes and think about this thing, cutting like a knife across the heart of the last great place left on the continent. That is perhaps a psychological impact whose importance I don't think we begin to understand yet. It would have been so much worse without the pipeline. There was a psychological effect on the American character. Uh, Jimmy Carter called it a malaise. Uh, people felt that we were losing control. And then the good old American know-how and engineers built this enormous pipeline in a fairly short time. And I think it, it helped to show a, a spirit that, that we are capable people, that we can overcome adversity. Well, as a memorial to everybody who worked on the pipeline, and that's in Valdez. It's really pretty moving. And one day I went by the monument there, and we'd had a tremendous snow. And the snow was right up to the necks of the people, you know, the, the statues there. And it was kind of indicative of what it took to build the pipeline. I mean, it looked like those guys were sitting there going like this, you know, trying to 
trying to, you know, just stay above water, if you will. You know, and it was perfect. It was perfect. It made me think that that's what building the pipeline was all about, struggling against those elements and overcoming them. Go aboard the floating mechanic.